So welcome back everyone to the Elusive Eye, The Nature and Function of the Self. Uh, this is part two. If you have missed part one, I strongly recommend going and seeing part one. Uh, before you look at part two, each episode is going to build on the previous one within a continuous argument. I'm joined here again by my good friends and uh, uh, co-interlocutors, uh, Christopher Master Pietro and Greg Enriquez. I'll give them a chance in a second to briefly introduce themselves. But just quickly, I'll give a very cursory overview of what we did last time. Last time we talked about getting our language very clear when we're gonna talk about this very difficult subject, the self, its nature and its function. And we talked about distinguishing folk models uh, sort of the implicit cultural models we carry around, folk phenomenological models and folk psychological models, and we can put those two together. The, the self has these psychological aspects and these phenomenological aspects. We call that thing the folk model. And we noted that one of the things that science typically does is it calls common sense folk models into question. It problematizes them in order to try and get a more profound understanding of them. And then I propose that we use uh, uh, Galen Strawson's seminal article on uh, the, where he basically lays out the characteristics of the folk model of the self. And we started working our way through them. I made a slight mistake last time. I said we had a couple more to do from Strawson. We actually finished Strawson's list. I'm gonna propose uh, we continue by adding two more on and that will launch us into our discussion. But first, I guess I, I said, I'm gonna get, give a, uh, Chris and Greg a chance to say hello and briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll continue. So maybe this time, Chris, you can go first. Hello, yes. Um, so yeah, Christopher Mastro Pietro. So of course, I'm one of your frequent writing partners in crime, John, especially on the meaning crisis and, um, and, uh, and issues of um, sacred symbols and so forth. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm here to find out how I'm doing at being a self. I think that's I think that's what thinks that that's what draws me in here. I think this is just a, a monitoring of progress. No, but I mean, in all seriousness, I think this is um, to me. This is, I think I'm, I think I'm here in a bit of an auditing capacity to try and trace out some of the existential phenomenology um, that maps over and runs alongside some of the more functional machinery that the two of you are going to be homing in on. So I think that's my value at at least for the moment. Well, I think in connection with that and extending that. I mean, the, the self is a sacred symbol and we have sacred symbol words we're gonna talk about, spirit and soul in relation to the notion of self. Yeah. And you're here because that's your particular area of expertise. Yep, amen. Yeah, I think I think one thing I'll be interested in, sorry, Greg, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and the fluidity that you have with language uh, <laughs> is why I'm happy you're here. <laughs> go ahead, Chris, here you go. I was just gonna say, yeah, the, about the, 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 the question of the symbols, just to kind of look ahead a little bit, I think one thing, it's too early, I think, to pose the question. There's a right time for, you know, right questions require the right timing. And that's something I'm gonna be very attentive to as we go forward. Um, Cause I don't, I certainly don't wanna come off half cocked. This is a very methodical, very systematic, very careful argument. So I wanna follow it properly. But yeah, as we, I think as we get a little bit further down the road, one question I'm very interested in looking at is the question of understanding the self as a symbolic mechanism, as a symbol in and of itself, or potentially, and or potentially as a, as a symbol that um, generates symbols, which I think is perhaps one way of understanding both descriptively and normatively how the self functions optimally and some of the phenomenology therein. So yeah, just sort of casting that question ahead a little bit, just prospectively, um, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. And Greg. Great. Yeah. Uh, so Greg Enriquez, you know, partner in crime and consciousness and now in the self. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I appreciated the summary. You know, I, as you know, you're deepening my analysis of cognition and consciousness, and I can feel the rhythm building on the self. I generated a blog on sort of the steps of consciousness and evolution, and uh, some of that was sparked or at least tweaked a little bit by some of the self-organization and self-modeling stuff that we were alluding to uh, in the last session. So. Mm. Excellent, excellent. So uh, we are also uh, trying to do something different in, in not only in content perhaps, but especially in manner. Uh, Greg and I found uh, uh, the, the, the process of dialogue around the argument concerning the nature of, and function of consciousness 
to be tremendously helpful and fruitful. And Chris and I have had similar experiences in multiple, uh, what we call dialogos. And, and then the last time that that was also the case, uh, the, uh, part one of the elusive eye. And so that's also something we're, we're trying to model a new way in which um, we can bridge between um, the academic world, uh, for want of a better word, and the, the, the sort of social media, um, and actually not just report on what's going on in the academic world to, to social media, but actually ge be generative, be actually participating in the process itself. Um, and so that's the third sort of feature I want to emphasize with what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, so one more point, and Greg alluded to it. Uh, we, we, all, we always have to be careful about the two uses of the word self. Uh, one is an entity use in which we're pointing to a thing, the self, and one is just a, a function of grammatical recursion when we say the tornado self-organizes. Although there was self-organization in a tornado, there is no self that has been organized in a tornado. So to be very careful, one of the things we can ask and we'll repeatedly ask, is there anything to the self above and beyond very sophisticated self-organization? And as we saw last time, the folk model of the self gives a very strong yes to that. There's, the self is a thing, it's a unified thing, it's a single thing, right, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna add two more things that I think belong on Strassen's list, but he didn't put there. Um, and as always, I'm going to go, but you guys interrupt me as you see fit because that works extremely well. And so just uh, for clarity, John, so, you're adding things that you think should fit into our everyday conception yeah, of the system, yeah. right? And what I'm doing is because, you know, it's easy to run sort of experiments on people and they will report these dimensions uh, quite, quite readily. Uh, they might not report them with some of the theoretical language we're going to use here, but there's a- God there's, help them. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, exactly. <laughs> uh, but there's a phenomenon we're trying to point to. So the first one is relatively, it's not that long, but it's important and we can hopefully touch on it. Uh, and, and again, this is, a, um, remember in phenomenology, we're trying to determine what are the invariant structures of our experience from, from those that are just contingent or culturally generated. Um, and so I have to use metaphors and the metaphors might be culturally misleading, but people say, that the self is inside of them. Um, and Hood reports an experiment, uh, the, Hood, the Hood book I'm referring to is called uh, The Self Illusion. And he reports an experiment in 2012 and you ask people to point where the self is. And what they do is they sort of point the third eye and the, te the temporal parietal junction. And it's sort of the intersection of those two points, pretty reliably, pretty generally. And when you ask people, people will sort of say, yeah, that's sort of where my self is. And you go, really? Like, does that, does that ultimately make any sense to you? Um, but, and, and what we have to remember in order to make that even a little bit more uh, questionable is other, other cultures have placed the self and felt it elsewhere in their body. Famously, Aristotle thought the, the, the self was, was the closest thing to the self in his psychology was located in the heart. And it looks like, and, and the Egyptians are even weirder because it looks like they have two selves and they both live in the liver uh, like what's going on there, right? And, and I'm sure if you asked Aristotle where he felt himself, he would say he felt it here and not without reason, right? Because where do you feel a lot of the self-relevant emotion? You feel them here in your chest, right? Um, and, and so again, I, I, well, I doubt that it's invariant, phenomenologically invariant that the self is here, It's mm -hmm. right? I think there is a sense in which people somehow feel the self is inside of them somewhere. And that isn't just sort of a, a reference. They sort of, they've created an enacted, and here's something Chris could build on later. There's an enacted symbol here. There's an, an there's a felt, I'm, you know, I'm here or I'm here. Um, and so I think that's an important aspect of the self, which means there's something at the phenomenological level that binds the sense of self to the body in a phenomenological fashion. And that's something that we need to get clear about because people, look like we talked about last time, they don't identify the self with the body, but the self is also intimately felt to be located in a particular place in the body that has some kind of central functional significance. Well, uh, actually, that's what, exactly what I was going to ask in terms of, do you know 
if that felt certainly for me at some level, and just if I just say it's some epicenter of central control. Um, but yeah. I mean, obviously it's not the epicenter of my body, but at some level, if I were to layer my body up, it would somehow be uh, imagined as to some epicenter of that center. Does that? Is that I, I think that's that? right, but I, I know that it's relative to um, sort of systems and practices you get involved in too. So, I mean, and in fact, when I'm teaching people the Tai Chi, I often tell them that they're a triangle. They're an upside down triangle. They're mostly in their head and then they go like this and that's why they're easily upset because they're like a triangle. <laughs> and, and one of the things like, for example, when I'm doing Tai Chi Chuan, the sense of self shifts from here to what the Dantian down there. And you move, everything is moving and perceiving from there. Um, so I do think it's functional, but I think the functionality is also malleable. So being a functional epicenter, I think at least phenomenologically moves around. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that makes sense because and we'll talk about it in a second. You can of course project your, se your sense of where you are also into avatars and other things like that. So it's yourself has to be located and, and you're right, Greg, I think it has to have some sort of functional centrality to it, but it's extremely malleable and, and how it's inside is also extremely uh, malleable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have much more to say about that right now, but I think that 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 what's missing from Strawson's list, he, he sort of, if you read his list, it sounds like there's not much of a connection between the self and the body. I and mean, I think that's, at, even at the folk model level, I think that's problematic. I think people experience the self as in the body some way, but in this extremely uh, malleable way. So anything you guys want to say about that right now, or um, I'm prepared to move on. That, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so the next <laughs> one is going to take us a little bit longer to go through. Um, and this is uh, the self has a sense of presence. The self has a sense of presence. And what I mean by that, and this goes back, uh, of course, initially to Nagel's seminal article on what's it like to be a bat. Mm. Your, your sense of self has with it a sense of what it is like to be me here now um, in this state of consciousness. So what it is like uh, to be me here now in this state of consciousness. But it's not like there's the me here now in the state of consciousness. The me here now and the state of consciousness are completely interwoven and interdefining. Uh, uh, and so there's a what's it like to be me here now in this state of mind? And, you know, one way I talk about this is um, people, uh, people report that that sense of presence, again, I mentioned it a minute earlier, it can move around. Mm -hmm. So sense of presence, in fact, is something that's sought mm -hmm. after in uh, virtual reality, video games. Mm -hmm. And I need to do, I need to fill, feed two burns with one scone here, uh, because uh, I need to set something up for the rubber arm illusion down the road. I'll, I'll just allude to that briefly. Okay. Um, so the idea here is, right, uh, what you look for in, v, uh, in VR is people say, I was in the game, mm -hmm. right? That's a sense of presence. Um, and I was, re I, and, you know, it's really in the game. I, I, they have the sense of, I hear now in the game, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's highly sought after because that sense of presence uh, makes the world of the VR real, makes it real. So actually what we're talking about is a kind of co-presencing. You have this co-determining co-presencing. You have the, the I here now presencing and, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's interwoven with the world is presencing to me mm -hmm. and those are woven together such that it's real. Mm -hmm. and, and notice that that realness is not based on verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. You can have you can have virtual realities that have a high degree of verisimilitude and do not give this sense of presence. And you can have games like Tetris that have very low verisimilitude and generate this sense of presence. Now, what, what's interesting about that is, like I said, is this sense of presence seems to be very central to an important dimension we talked about last time to the self, namely uh, your capacity for self-consciousness. Mm. But the thing about it is, as you can see with the VR, it's very malleable where you are. We're gonna talk about some things later on in, in the series, like the rubber arm illusion, 
that, that, you, that you're right where your sense that basically what the illusion is you have your arm you you cover it with a rubber arm your so your your arm is is occluded that your right the rubber arm is on it and I stroke your arm and the rubber arm at the same time and you feel yourself in the rubber arm the rubber arm illusion and in a similar way you feel yourself in the game and what people like Metzer, Metzinger and others are doing is they're using the combination of sort of VR and things like the rubber arm illusion to try and create, they're close to creating out of body experiences, mm -hmm. out of body experiences. And this again, gives us this, well, what is it? And, what, and of course, when we do that, we'll have to talk about, because Metzinger proposes that sort of the phenomenological origin of the idea of a soul. And we'll, we'll have to come back to all of that. But we have to take that into account precisely because people do have out of body experiences. They do experience the rubber arm illusion. Right. They do project into VR. So this sense of presence. Now I wanna say a bit more about it. Um, and I wanna talk about that it has what I call, so here's a bit of multisyllabic stuff. It'll make it sound like we're saying stuff really important. Um, it has demonstrative indexicality. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what, we have to we have to contrast demonstrative from categorical nouns. So if I say pencil, like it, it has to refer to an entity like this. But if I use the demonstrative, if I say this, or this, or this, there's no categorical identity. All that's happening is a here nowness standing out to this salience landscape, this state of consciousness in this world. That's what's happening. That's what a demonstrative does. And similarly, these two terms are related. Indexicality are things that only refer to the here nowness. Like when I, and those are two indexical words. When I say here, it's for me, it's pointing here. For you, it's okay. pointing there. Same thing with now, etc. And so what I'm pointing to is you have, and it's very hard to put into words, but you have for your your sense of self, you have a this here nowness, I-ness, what it's like to be me in this state of mindness, <laughs> right? It's that, it's that, that, and I want to, instead of constantly saying that really clumsy phrase, I want to call that the demonstrative indexicality of the sense of self. It has that sense of presence, the demonstrative indexicality. I want to also point out that demonstratives and, and indexicality, they, they fall below categorical identities. They fall below conceptual thought. In fact, the ability to create a category depends on them, right? right? So what, when, I, when I'm forming a category, what I have to do is I have to mentally group a bunch of things together, right? You know, let's say, you know, well, well this and this, right? And then once I group them together and then I go this, and then after I do that, after I've grouped them by demonstrative indexicality, then I can start to see what they have in common and then I can form a category, which means if the self has an important, and this will come back later, if the self has this important aspect of it, of demonstrative indexicality, it very much falls below conceptual categorical experience in an important way. Um, so when I'm talking about that, um, that, co-presencing, that brings up what Chris and I have talked about as perspectival knowing. Perspectival knowing is precisely knowing what it is, what it is like to be this here nowness in the way the world is presenting it to me. We, we capture that with the metaphor of a perspective, because a perspective is how things are standing out to you, how, right? How, uh, how you are present to them, how they are present to you. And, and Greg and I also talked a lot about this um, in Untangling the World Knot. We talked a lot about perspectival knowing. And, and the thing about a perspective is it combines exactly that, the two poles of what I've been talking about. It, com it, com it, it integrates the sort of, um, the part of the pole that has to do with my state of consciousness and the part of the pole that has to do with how the world is disclosing it. And when those are co-present, I get the sense of presence of the sense of realness I know what it is like to be me here now in this state of mind, in this state of world. Now, the, the, what, 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 what we get into a little bit deeper though, as we, it, it, right, it, and Greg and I also talked about this. 
uh, and when it was actually kind of important to the discussion about consciousness. Um, you see, when, when I say the I here nowness, I'm having the perspectival knowing, but you can also say, but how do you, like, what is the knowing in which, what is the knowing of the perspectival knowing? And so the way to think about this is, if I ask you this question, are you conscious right now? And people go, well, yeah. And I, well, I say, well, how, right? right? You, 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 you are conscious, you know you're conscious in the same act as being conscious, right? You know you're conscious by being conscious. So normally the, the subject and the object of knowledge are distinct from each other, but in things like consciousness, they are not distinct. They participate in each other. Um, and so we call, I, I call this, and Chris and I talk about this as participatory knowing, where you, it's knowing by being the thing that you know. So you don't just know yourself by having beliefs about yourself. You don't just know yourself by having skills about yourself. You don't know yourself even by knowing what it's like to have perspectives and states of consciousness. You also know yourself by being yourself. And I don't mean that in sort of an authenticity. I mean, the act of being a self and the act of knowing the self are coterminous with each other, coextensive with each other. They're not semantically identical, but they are coextensive with each other. And that's a participatory knowing. And so there's an important relationship between participatory knowing and perspectival knowing in the self. Greg and I have also already argued there's an important relationship between participatory knowing and perspectival knowing in consciousness. And of course, there's an important connection between self and consciousness in self-consciousness. And so it's no surprise that we find that we're, we're, we're converging on um, this sort of, or triangulating on the, these set of properties that we're talking about. I've been talking a lot, I'll, 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 I'll open up some space for you guys to well, offer some commentary. No, it's, uh, well, I guess my uh, sort of this question of like whether we're, I'm, I'm holding off on this or we're gonna <laughs> this now. And, and that's uh, adverbial versus adjectival yep. framing. And yep. I wasn't sure, to me, you were screaming. Now that I speak the language, you're screaming. <laughs> Well, know, adverbial qualia here at one level that I could loop in, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> well, I, I think about the script. <laughs> so I think it's appropriate to bring that up, but I think the place to bring it up is when I when we move to James, and <laughs> we talk about the distinction between the I and the me. I think that uh, because you actually did that mapping spontaneously when I brought that up in Untangling the World Knot. I did, right? Yeah, right? No, a, and so I think a, that's a, I think there's a good okay. reason why that, that sort of, that spontaneous intuition should be uh, uh, savored. But let me, if I can, I'll just, I will say this in relationship to the self, okay? So if, for me, what you're describing here, yep. I'll sometimes use the term epistemological portal. If I use yep. the term epistemological portal, epistemology, of course, how we know. Yep. And I do not mean this propositionally, but I mean this through the senses. Okay? Right. Uh, so this system is directing the perspectival and participatory grip or groove in the agent arena relationship. Right, right, yeah. No? Yep, and very so, much. And, and one of the things that's interesting when we put it in relationship to the self, right, is that if I shift over here, all of a sudden, the what's on the screen shifts, but this thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this thing yeah. has a continuity, okay? Yeah. And if this thing starts to have like extended working memory and any kind of self-aware memory kinds of processes, that connection to this fundamental kind of architecture of, of self, the window into the world, that's what it's, that's what that's speaking to me. I think that's great. I, I, I was really sparked by, in fact, the first part of what you said about the uh, the self is kind of this finding a groove, an optimal grip in the agent arena relationship. And, and I think that's going to bring out something we're going to need to discuss at length. We talked about it last time um, when, we, when we talked about um, sort of features of the self, uh, but we're going to come back to it in more depth when uh, we talk about, you know, when we, we did last time, we'll come back when we talk about agency and adaptive autonomous autopoiesis. Remember, we went through that as one of the criteria. And so the relationship between the self and the agent and reading relationship, um, which of course uh, has to do with something that Chris cares a lot about, which is your existential mode. Um, I think that's gonna be central. And then, like, and then what you said, that continuity, right? That there's some continuity behind the eyes of the perspective 
that we need to try and talk about because it's a very strange continuity uh, phenomenologically. Did that did that respond enough? Yeah, to you? Now, that... I'll put one other thing on this, and then yeah, I'll please, Christopher. If you have... So uh, I'm a clinician, uh, right? Uh, so I attend a lot to this issue of presence. Okay. Right. Um, ah. In the core. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and and the relationship to that system has either to powerful memories or to powerful events, uh, and certainly one of the things that we look at is when people get what's called derealization or depersonalization. Right, right. Yeah. Right, is when the presence mm. is bumped off. Right, um, right. And so, you know, you get traumatized or other things start to happen in relationship to the co. So I'm always looking for the coherent organization and integration across levels vertically and horizontally. And then trauma and other things will break that, dissociate that. And then boom, hey, I wasn't even there. And right. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. So this idea really has, you know, it jumps into that, even though we're not at full human person self consciousness yet, we're still seeing the, the beginnings of where that would. Oh, go. that was beautiful. Mm. I don't mean the phenomena. The phenomena I imagine is horrifying. But what <laughs> you just, the theoretical move, the connection just made was great, Greg. Thank you. That's really good. That's really good. The, the, you know, the how the sense of presence can be lost in depersonalization. Right and derealization, and again we get sort of the poles of the agent and the arena uh, being lost. That yeah, that I should have thought of that. Sorry, I don't want to take anything away from you. That's just really, really good. I mean, and that nope. that is something that is something that you I guess you have to develop clinical antennae for. Uh, you know how that sense of presence is, you know, coming on or going offline. It's a it's a big deal actually. The degree of coherent integration. Through the what I call through the heart into the body, which actually, by the way, goes into sort of the primate self and then the felt valence. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then are you centered? And like when I have my kind of freaky wisdom energy, essentially what's happening is an opening up all the way down and a presencing. Like I, I literally said, my cells are online. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. Right, Andy, right, I'm like, right. I am mm. here. So anyway, that's another, that's another good point. How in in mystical experiences of varying degrees you get an intensification of the sense of presence it's part of the what i've called the ontonormativity the real the real realness of these experiences yeah very much P people even talk about the intensity of the sense of presence becoming something like a sense of eternity uh, a sense of timelessness right a, in the moment is forever yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly exactly chris did you want to uh, offer any reflections at this point or I have one that might actually be very confluent with what you just brought up, Greg, uh, bringing the agent arena relation into the mix and, and this idea of, of derelation is really interesting. Um, so one of the, th so speaking from now the folk phenomenological perspective, not the functional, but just the phenomenological, yeah. one of the experiences I think that is, um, that's aroused by the perspectival enclosure that is, indexed by the this here and nowness that you keep talking about john one of the one of the i think one of the formal experiences that seems to be entailed by that is the experience of extending the in, the sociability of the self to the features of the environment regardless of whether those features are inherently social or not oh. so one of the things that mead says for instance is that we take the object, we, we take the features of our environment first to be social objects before we take them to be physical objects. And right. what that means, what, what that means in concrete terms is that there we characterize at any given moment the perspect the perspectival enclosure that worlds us at any given moment is 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 adorned with a cast of characters that are made from the features of our environment that present themselves to us. Mm. So I think that there's an experience of the self's sociability extending into the environment and oh. then feeding back on itself recursively, right? Oh. So you so you know think of um, for instance you know think of the way you are 
Well, actually, I think we use this at some point in our writing, John, as an example. Think of the way you interact with your bedroom when you're a right. kid. Right. The features of your bedroom speak to you. They, they represent yourself to you. They reflect and pot potentially also refract that sense yeah. of presence. But the yeah. sense of one of the ways in which that sense of presence is alluded to us is in the form of an ostensive social interaction with the otherwise inanimate features of that environment. Oh. And the, the, the speaking to us of, the, of our environment is, I think, one of the fundamental things that countenances the presence and makes us feel a self as felt, even if we're not in social company. Oh, and that, one of the things that sometimes no, that, oh, I think sorry. people can people can lose, and I, this is what, I, I wonder if this is connected to the derelation um, uh, concept that you've introduced, Greg, you can tell me. But one of the things that can sometimes happen, sometimes the environment oh, seems particularly pregnant with ourselves, and sometimes it seems that ourselves are nowhere to be found in our environment. And, and I'm speaking right now in solitude. So just take, take the yep. situation as a solitary one for now. Although I think it's also true of proper, properly social company. So when you go back to your bedroom that you occupied as a child, the bedroom doesn't speak to you anymore in the way that it did, right? It doesn't, yeah, yeah. It doesn't present yourself and I, it doesn't present itself to you, and therefore it doesn't present yourself to you in the same way that it did, because there's now a discontinuity of participation. And this is where the participatory knowing yeah, comes from. Yeah. There's a continuity of participation with the environment that represents yourself to yourself and thus presences it. And that's something that's, I think, at least phenomenologically, it's probably functionally as well, part of what the perspectival enclosure entails. Fascinating. Sorry for interjecting, Chris. I just got excited. That was brilliant. That was really good. That was really good. Um, so uh, I'll, let me just go, go ahead, a Greg. few go ahead. pieces of, of thought in relationship. I loved the way in which the environment, a couple of things. One is I, I perceive us as unbelievably social in ourselves. Yeah, in fact, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, and I mentioned that in terms of the consciousness, it's sort of like, I think consciousness upgrades when we have mothers and offspring and, and the attachment relation. And I think it completely upgrades when we get an intersubjective space. Mm -hmm. um, Tomasello shared attention. Yep, and yep. I think we then just, and then as ourself, then as social agents, that when we then construct something like a room, a tool, we, and participate in it, the extension of that to ourselves and the presencing we'll feel with that. I thought the way you articulated that was very, very powerful and gets into the extended self. We can talk some about that in yeah, terms of, you know, how yeah. the self wears its boundaries in relationship to time yep. and space. Excellent. So yeah. that's one piece. Right, the other piece right. from, a, from a clinical perspective that's really interesting is that a number of people will put a continuum on essentially the presencing of animation in the environment, okay? Whereby certain disorders are, have enormous difficulty with this, like, uh, many people will interpret uh, autism as having a particularly difficult structure to impute social intentionality into the environment and place mm. oneself in relation. And things like paranoid schizophrenia and other kinds of things impute animism everywhere. Right, um, right. And then see themselves mm. as sort of actors in the world and the world acting upon them in this very stage. You know, you feel on stage, everything is this interactive presence of the social dynamic. So that's another... And I think clinically about what can go on, how do you balance mm. the various okay. sort of self other self animate self inanimate projections and, and keep the optimal grip dance right. in that yeah. flow. Yeah. So, yeah. Ah, wow. Right. That was excellent. So then this introduces some like some real normative questions then when it comes to the management of the self and its correlation to the spatialization of your experience. Yep. Right, because you hear people all, all saying all the time, you know, I feel most myself when I'm here. I feel yeah. least yeah. like myself, right? You, you, you lecture about culture shock, John, yeah, right? One of the exactly. things that you lecture about is that the yeah. dislocation of oneself from the home that structures the phenomenology and the perspectival features of the experience is precisely what we mean by culture shock, a place in which yourself is no longer present. And yet, on the other hand, we also hear, and it's ritualized or at least once was ritualized within our culture is that you have to actually venture into new places in order to find yourself or remember yeah. yourself 
because there is a correlation between the self inside of you and the and the and the different environs that can reproduce what is implicitly present into more of an explicit presence a discoverable presence that you can then interact with and relate to so this idea that the relation of yourself or the relation to yourself is structured by the sense of place that lends character to the experience of being oneself and i think that's a and, and how that relates to memory and so forth. Anyway, so I, I look forward to getting more into that that's question. A, that's, as we a, go along. Yeah, that's a real important thing for us to ask us when we really start to talk about the human development, our current state. Yep. What's a healthy, structured yep. self? So anyway. So, so I think, I mean, this is not a summary. It's just a, a criterion to mark what you said. I think the way you brought out, uh, well, the two of you brought out what, you know, the existential uh, dimensions of the sense of presence. And how you know we that helps to explain things like derealization, depersonalization, homesickness, loneliness, right? All of these things that right, and, and, and these are all important ways in which the sense of presence and the sense of self and the sense of uh, of the realness of the world are bound up together in a mutually interpenetrating fashion. And Greg, you're right to bring out that you know when you replied to Chris, I, I, like I. I'm agreeing with it. I'm not right. I'm just agreeing with it. Um, that um, that you know that, that that normativity, you know, really challenges. And we talked about this the synchrotic problem of the self. You know where its boundaries are. Where like if you're only yourself in your familial room um, and familial familiar room, um, then like where's the boundary of the self then? Like, right. Uh, and what happens when your body is still all there, but your self is being derealized? Where's the boundary of the self now? Um, so uh, already we're seeing where we're heading, which is the, 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 the move I'm going to make, which is as you start to more rigorously unpack the phenomenology of the folk model and the functionality of the folk model, you start to see the problems about the folk model that it doesn't, the features don't hang together in a obviously coherent fashion. They seem to already be undermining each other. Um, and then, uh, so note that they, that's apparent. And that leads me to a related issue from what Strassen gave us. Um, and it's an ironic kind of issue. So Strassen has presented the folk model, and I think he's correct to do this because we have good evidence that most folk models are like this, as what's called a feature list. It's just this feature, and this feature, and this feature, and this feature, and this feature. Now, the problem with that is that's how all, all, that most folk models run this way, but what, what you know, the work of Medine and Murphy and others way back in the mid 80s showed is that's not, that actually doesn't carry our understanding of a phenomenon. It doesn't, it's not adequate to it. Let me give you a, 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 a quick example of what I mean. Um, my, my favorite example, and these, both these gentlemen have heard it many times, so they have to they have to suffer through it again. But you know, well, what's a bird? Well, it has wings and it has feathers and it has a beak and it has a talon and it flies. So I'm gonna get a couple of wings. I'm gonna get a beak. I'm gonna get a pile of feathers. Gonna put some talons in it. Sort of mush it all up and then throw it in the air and it's flying. That's a bird, right? And you go, no, it's not. It's not a bird at all. And this, of it's course, a mess. A, yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> and this is this is a point that goes back through Aristotle to Plato, right? And Chris and I talk a lot about this with the logos, right? Um, but and remember that because logo, logos is in all of our our words where we claim to be understanding something like psychology, the logos of the psyche, right? That's there. So what's lacking in my bird mess? Uh, what's the birdiness is lacking? And what's lacking there? is a structural functional organization such that those features fit together, belong together, and act as a causal whole such that it is appropriate to attribute properties to that whole as opposed to the parts, like the bird is flying. You don't say the wings are flying or the feathers are flying, mm -hmm. right? It's the bird as a whole is flying. And not only is that a function of how it is, and that's what I meant when I pointed to logos and ology, it's a function of how it's understood, not only how it is, but how it's understood to understand a bird is to grasp that structural functional organization that actually makes it be a bird. Which me, and this is why it's an irony, because the feature list, 
the, the first line in the feature is the self is a unified thing, right? But what we're not given is the structural function organization that unifies it as a thing and, and, and provides for an integrated explanation of it as a thing. So the structural functional organization, the logos of it is fundamentally missing. And that means uh, we are not, we, we are already significantly hamstrung when we try to think about the self from the folk psychological and folk phenomenological model if it is just a feature list, because feature lists uh, perennially lack an ability to represent this structural functional organization, the logos, the gestalt. You should use Greek or German when you can, because it makes you sound very philosophical. Um, and so, and, and I take it that that irony is telling the fact that the unity of the self is emphasized and yet it is not exemplified in the description or the explanation of the self is a telling glaring gap that, that, in the folk model of the self. And this is a deeply problematic thing that needs to be addressed. So I'll stop there for a second. You guys wanna riff on that at all? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll riff on that for a second. I have yeah. something to say, say about that. Yeah, so let's just, let's. All right, I, I do try to stay contained, but the, you know, the <laughs> audience know what I am. You know, so here's my basic, you know, I'll come back to the basic pitch. The enlightenment gives us Newtonian ontology of matter in motion. You get a Kantian phenomenology view and they sort of jam them together. You can go German idealism with, with yeah. Hegel but certainly European into American psychology and then the folk model of what it is that we are right. at the level of human psychology is broken and devoid. I mean, mm -hmm. the scholars can't put the structural functional model together. Yes. People can't, they sort of know that it's there, but they don't know how. So we get things like, and you've heard me say this, you know, I'm hanging with my nephew after $50,000 of going to college. Hey, what did you learn? I'm just a bunch of chemicals. Right. No, <laughs> that's not what you should have learned for $50,000 for your first year of college. That's a nightmare. Okay. Right. And so we would get to the meaning crisis. How the hell is modernity with all of its scientism helping us actually understand the metaphysics of what it is that we are? And it hasn't. And that's a problem. Right. I think that's an excellent point. The fact that we have a worldview framework that gives us no metaphysical tools, no conceptual, theoretical and meta-theoretical tools by which we can try and bring about a realization of that structural functional organization of the self. I think that's an excellent point. I think that's a, a, that's a, uh, that's a yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's something that should, we should keep in mind. Chris, did you wanna say anything about that point about the lack of the logos? in the folk model? Not, I don't think so. Maybe a, a, except for the fact that it's simply relating the bird, uh, the bird, the bird metaphor, the, the example that you give about the features of the bird, relating it back to your question before about the location, the, the locus of the self yeah. and the body, I think is a helpful thing to bear in mind, right? Because, you know, no, no more can the self be found concretely in the body than the logos of the bird can be found concretely in the breast of the bird. And I think that yeah, if we yeah, yeah. Co correlating those two, I think is just a helpful reminder to us. And yeah. it's also just telling that the feature list of the self of, as you've recited is still presupposing a fundamental transparent unity through which the features are being observed and not actually accessing it or explicating it, which is exactly. just, I think you've, you've said that already, but that's just one, one way of thinking about it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 Presupposed unity is never explicated or explained. Um, and that uh, means there's a way in which the folk model is fundamentally self undermining in a profound way. And then what Greg said is when we turn to the sort of the psychological scientific worldview to help try and help uh, ameliorate that, we don't get the resources by which uh, to, to address it, or at least until very recently, perhaps we don't have the resources uh, to address it. Um, so they may be found somewhere, John. <laughs> Maybe found somewhere. <laughs> so that how it all fits together will slide us into a very important topic that um, is often associated with the folk model, uh, but 
uh, Strassen doesn't put it in, and I, I and that's because um, he sees it as inherently problematic. So I want to talk about it as a further way of problematizing the self, because one of the ways in which people think um, the self is bound together is through narrative, right? Through narrative. Um, but as soon as we say that, we have to be very careful, um, and we have to make another distinction here. And I know people are going, all these distinctions? Yes, all these distinctions, because, like, and this is, this is a direct quote, right? Right? You know, the, the psychological work on the self is a conceptual morass. That's a direct quote uh, from pivotal figures, you know, in, in the field. Um, and, 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 and we all sort of know this, right? And that's Greg's point. We all know that our, our sense of self is, is fragmentary and, and, and it's not hanging together properly or well for us. Um, so what's the distinction? The distinction is uh, in narrative between the language of training and the language of explaining. So let me give you first uh, outside of the self, although it has to do with memory, which relates to the self, a clear example of that. So we can train, and, and, and as somebody who teaches Tai Chi Chuan, right, and other things, and my, and my meditation, the language I use to train people and the language I use to try and explain these phenomena are very different languages indeed, because they're directed towards different goals and they presume different contexts and they, and they presume different shared languages. So let me give you an example though. So one of the ways I can improve my memory is I can use what's called the method of loci, the method of locations, the ancient orders do this. I take some space that I'm familiar with, like a building, it has all these rooms and I put a, you know, a salient image that will, I associate in this one room and there's a topic there and then another room and Sherlock did this and what he, I, don't, I can't remember, did he call it his memory palace or his mind palace in Sherlock with starring Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch? And, 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 and this like, I have to have notes here for this, what I'm doing here, but these guys can use the method of loci for, and, you know, for speeches that lasted six hours. So what, what the, the idea that memory is, right, it's called the spatial metaphor, that memory is laid out spatially with stable objects in stable locations and importance is captured by proximity is a powerful way to train your memory. It will improve your memory. It will extend its powers. But as Isaac and Keen famously pointed out a long time ago, right, 1990, the spatial metaphor for memory by which we train memory will terribly mislead you when you try to explain memory. Because you don't do a search through memory the way you search through a palace. Because I can ask you, what's Meryl Streep's phone number? And you go, I don't know. You didn't check all the locations and go, nope, that's not Meryl Streep. That's not Meryl Streep. That's not Meryl Streep. That's uh, ha, have you ever been to Bangkok? No. You don't go, well, here, that's not Bangkok. That's not Bangkok. That, you, you know, like that. And also the idea that, you know, things that are close in association are somehow close together in memory. So if I say, uh, you know, blue to you, you'll say yellow. Uh, uh, you know, as an association, or if I say blue to you, you'll say new, because it, it, it rhymes. So when I say new to you, you think yellow, right? Well, no, of course not. Although blue is somehow really close to yellow and really close to new, that doesn't mean that new and yellow are somehow close to each other. They're very, they're very far apart, mm. right? And we know, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, memory, doesn't, memory is not a stable object. Memory is massively reconstructed. This is one of the most um, sort of robust findings we have about how our memory operates. So what's the lesson? And I can give you many other examples of this. I'm just using, I'm gonna, I hope this is satisfying because I think it's pretty powerful. The language we use to train memory, to extend it, to make it more powerful, should not be transferred uh, in an uncritical manner to how we try and explain memory. In a similar and I think strong analogy, we have very good evidence that narrative enhances and extends the self. This is situational interactional theory. This is the work of Daniel Hudo on the narrative practice hypothesis. Narrative is not natural to us. And I keep getting into debates with people about this because yes, it is. I'm sorry, no, it's not, um, right? And you, you know, you have to you even look at the work of Thomas Sello and others. We have to practice narrative. We have to give children terribly simplified narratives compared to how we don't have to simplify our language around them because they are naturally linguistic. 
but we have to practice again and again and again. The Teletubbies, I had to sit through it twice in my lifetime. You know, oh, Tinky Winky wants to go to the market. Poe wants to come along, but Poe isn't finished the dishes. What will they do? Oh, right? And, and stuff like that. And, and, and Hudo's point is we practice narrative all day long. And the point is, Hudo argues that what narrative does is it improves our ability to pick up on other people's mental states. Situational interactional theory says, what narrative does is it allows you to become a more temporally extended self because what you can do is you can link different tenses of the self by narrative. Uh, Dan Siegel argues that what narrative does is it helps you get better at attaching to your attachment figures. So one of the things that predicts how well you, your primary caregiver can attach to you in the, in the psychological sense is their capacity for autobiography, right? And all these things go together. So narrative is something that massively allows us to empower and extend the self. But does that mean it's also intrinsic to the nature of the self? And here's where Galen Strassen comes back. And in another famous article, he says, you know, everybody talks about this but I don't experience myself narratively. I'm a moral agent. I'm a professor. I, I think, you know, I, I write a career. I, but I don't experience myself in a fundamental narrative fashion. Then we know that when people get into even, I, 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 maybe Strassen is statistically abnormal, but statistically normal people, when they get in the flow state, the narrative sense of self completely disappears. But their sense of agency and their sense of presence doesn't disappear. It is actually enhanced. So there's a lot of reason for not immediately assuming that simply because narrative trains the self, that the self is inherently a narrative entity. Um, so I think what I'm trying to get at with that is narrative is an attempt to try and uh, maybe generate a sense of continuity and train it but it not, may not, might, might not actually be able to explain it because I think there's something, if you'll allow me, fictional about our narrative sense of identity. Why do I say that? Now I'm gonna invoke what I've talked about before and Hood and many other people talk about this, which is the massive recon, massively reconstructive nature of memory. So Locke had the idea that, you know, this is how it works. Here's your, you, you know, your accurate memories of like when you're a five-year-old and then they overlap with your accurate memories of the six-year-old. So the six-year-old can point to the five-year-old memories and they were accurate and it's all layered. And it's like a computer file and everything's layered and everything is stored and it's stable. And as I've already told you, that's just not the case. So your memory is not like a, uh, a computer file. I like Hood's example that he uses in the, in, uh, the self-illusion. He says, your memory is like a compost, right? The stuff at the top, is very accurately distinct, but as you sink down, right, uh, it everything is dissolving and merging and, and, and getting all confused and mixed up together. And what we have is we have a host of evidence. Elizabeth Loftus made this famous, all of this famous way back in the eighties. That the clinicians we, still have trauma about this, John. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll give her. I'll give her one story, uh, and it could have been a traumatic story, but I guess it wasn't. Um, so she carries around this. I believe you, regardless. <laughs> <laughs> she carries around this cherished childhood memory of this wonderful day when their whole family was in a car and the car broke down and the dad had to go and try and get some gas and some help, right? But fortunate, it just happened to be it was like a gift from the gods. There was this amazing ice cream store there, and they the whole family went and had ice cream, and they it was a beautiful day, and they went, wow, this could have been a disaster, but look at how wonderful. And Loftus carries around this shared childhood memory that, oh, that was such a great event in my life. And then when she told this, she carried it around for years. And then she finally sort of shared it with her family members at a family gathering. And they all started laughing. <laughs> and, they, she, and she was kind of hurt. Like, don't you guys value this experience? This is one of my cherished childhood memories. And they said to her, you hadn't been born then. That happened like two years before you were born. She had heard this story multiple times mm -hmm. and then she had internalized it and then like the compost it right the boundaries between the self and other and the world had dissolved 
And that had become part of her identity and her cherished narrative. But that of course, isn't actually capturing uh, something that has been persistent through time. Um, and this for, to me reminds me of uh, Wittgenstein's criticism of you know, the search for an essence. We think that because we use the word game, that there's an essence running through them, but instead, and finally, he uses the idea of family resemblance. He said, it's more like a rope. There's no one thing running through it. There's all this interlap and interweaving and, and merging. And so the evidence for the reconstructive na na nature of memory is very prevalent. And this, is, and this makes sense because your memory is adaptive. Remember, we talked about adaptive agency. Your memory is not trying to be an accurate recorder of the past. It is trying to be an adaptive anticipator of the future. It's trying to predict and prepare. That's what I mean by anticipation for the future. Let me give you an example of how this works. So this is what you can do. You can give people a bunch of sort of dot diagram, just random dots on a page, a bunch of them. Like here's five or six of them. And you show them to people say, look at this. I want you to remember it. Or I want you to remember it. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Let's say there's five or six. Then you stop and you say, now I'm going to show you, you turn around, you're not going to see, I'm going to show you one. I want you to tell me if this was one of the patterns you've seen before. And people are sort of okay at that. But you know what I can do is I can take all of those different patterns and I can calculate the arithmetic average of them, the mean. And I'll get a pattern that was never presented to them, but it re represents the arithmetic mean of all of those patterns. And you know what people will say? They'll be very confident they saw that picture. Yes, I saw that picture for sure, even though they never did. Because what is the brain doing? It's doing data compression. It's like when you do a scatter plot and you take all the points and you draw the line between them. The brain is doing data compression. It's taking all of this and trying to predict what's the most likely pattern I'm gonna see next. And that's what it remembers seeing. It's an adaptive anticipator of the future, not an accurate recorder of the past. And that massively reconstructive nature of memory undermines the claim that what we're doing in narrative is anything other than training the ability to extend the self into the future in an adaptive fashion, as opposed to finding some essential feature of the self at its core. Now, notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that narrative doesn't matter. What I'm saying is we have to be very careful about whether or not the, the, the sense of the security of the continuity of our identity that is given to us by our folk phenomenology and our folk psychology actually points to something in a clear and definitive manner. And what reconstructive memory shows is we can seriously problematize the idea that narrative gives us uh, some guarantee, some continuity. I want to make it even worse, which is narrative is a practice in non-logical identity. We talked about this last time. There's a weird thing where you look at a picture of a two-year-old and you say, there I am, right? Or you think, I need to save for when I'm 85, right? Or something like that, or 65, I should say. Um, um, so I'm 85, I'm going to probably be dead. But anyways, maybe not. My dad lived to like 90 something, so maybe I've got a chance. Um, anyways, um, and the problem with non-logical identity is a famous problem, which is continuity. So I want you to listen to me very carefully. Continuity, even if you got continuity, remember I said narrative may not give us the continuity we think we have, but continuity doesn't guarantee identity. This is Theseus's ship. So Theseus is a wooden ship in ancient Greece and he's got a cargo full of wooden planks and he's sailing from Syracuse. And as he, he's sailing, one of the planks rots and he, he has to replace it from one of the planks in his ship and he's cursed by the gods and this keeps happening. So that by the time he gets to Athens, every single plank in the ship has been repair, replaced by the, the wood from the hold. Now is the ship that comes into Athens the same ship that left Syracuse? There's definitely continuity, but people go, and famously, that's why it's a famous example. People famously go, I don't know. And then you can make it really even more confusing that as Theseus, right, what, what Theseus is, starts to do, it, well, well, let's do the Star Trek version. You know, Star Trek, there was a famous original series. If you guys don't know it, it's a science fiction show, Captain Kirk. It really ages me, but some of you probably- I know it. <laughs> yeah. And they rebooted it that not that long ago. So it should be back to some degree in co common 
parlance. But there was a device on it called the transporter and you could get into it and it would, you know, turn you, basically turn you into energy, beam you to some place and then reconstitute you. And a famous philosophical question is, is that you? There's causal continuity, but is that you? Or is it a really good copy of you? And you say, well, no, it's me. And that's what the show thinks. But what if, what if you start out here and instead of one copy, it makes four copies of you? Are they all you? And, and if they're all you, can I kill two of you? And yet I haven't killed you because you're still here? Uh, and you get like, so continuity and identity don't, they don't, like one does not necessarily guarantee uh, the other. So the sense of a persistent self is not only undermined because the sense that narrative is evidence for that is very questionable. We know that we don't have, you know, categorical and logical identity. We think we've got a continuity that points to persistence, but continuity doesn't guarantee identity in any uh, necessary fashion. And so the self is now, I would argue, extremely problematized at this point. But, and then uh, what I'm gonna do next is, is the self even a thing? But before I do that, uh, chance for you guys to riff as you, as you, as you might be want to do. Um, do you want to go ahead, Greg, or shall I? Sure. I mean, if, uh, I'm flexible. Uh, if, you, if you have something on the tip of your tongue, fire. Okay. I've, okay. I've got. I've got two. One is. One is just a question, though. So maybe I'll just throw in a question. It's just a clarification question, actually. Um, you might be not not be able to answer it, John, because it's a it's it's attribution to another person. It's Strassen. But I, when you say that Strassen makes the claim. Yep. that he does not have a narrative sense of identity. I don't think I can fully understand what he means by that. Like, does he give concrete examples? For instance, does that mean that he doesn't, when he, when he brings to mind certain individuals in his life or certain events that he doesn't think of them in an episodic sequence ah, let's, unfolding so across time? What, like how, how does he, like, what does that mean in concrete terms for him? Okay, but let, 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 let's come back to that and let's go to uh, situational interaction theory, right? We, episodic memory is natural to us, but if you ever talk to a four-year-old, they have episodic memory, but ask them what happened in their day. They'll give you their episodes, but it will be like an acid trip. So it's like, mm -hmm. right? And the idea is you have to practice with narrative a lot in order to turn that into a, a coherent, interpenetrating sequence of episodes. And what Strassen argues is, no, he just has sort of the episodes and he has, right? He, and they sort of, they bunch in places, but he doesn't think there's any sort of continuous narrative running from beginning to end throughout. And he doesn't find that that, is um, like really undermining of his agency. And on the other end, you will be people, you know, within deep meditative practices who claim similar things. They'll claim that they've lost the narrative self, but they are able to function in the world in a completely uh, normal fashion. In fact, this is one version of the claim to being an enlightened individual uh, that, you know, uh, you know the, the Buddha called himself the Tathagata, right? Always coming, always going, because he wasn't, Right, he was never here. Siddhartha Gautama was no longer ever here. There was just um, sort of his agency. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, that's right, you do this. And, and Strassen, Strassen, and I take him at his word because we shouldn't bully his phenomenology. He says he has exactly the same quizzical thing between us. He doesn't see what we're on about. Like he really doesn't see what we're on about. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 I feel I might be doing him an injustice, but I recommend reading the article. I mean, the, uh, as an argumentative thing, it's hard to say, yeah, my, my, my account trumps your phenomenology. I and mean, he says, no. Uh, and, and, sure, yeah. Sure. Yeah, right? no, I don't want to pre presume upon him, certainly, if we have to take him at his word. I do find it to be a very, very curious statement. And I think that it's one that I, I, I'm, I'll read the article. Maybe I'll resurface this again, because I find that I find that that's a statement that for me needs a little bit more qualification. Um, because we can think of because we can think of it at so many different levels of resolution, right? We can think of it in the gestalt form of an overwhelming 
autobiography. And then we can think of it in a much more segmented fashion, something more periodic, something that's more time bounded within specific contexts, such as the span of a particular day, as opposed to the span of an epoch of life or the span of an entire life, right? So saying that he doesn't have a persistent sense of identification of an overwhelming autobiography that arcs throughout the course of his life is a very different thing than him saying that he doesn't let's say, rely on narrative in order to access the episodic memories that unfold over the course of a week. Like, those are very different things to me, and I'm still not sure what she means. So, anyway, I mean, I, maybe, I, maybe I, I'll just have to... No, 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 I, I mean, let's talk about it for a sec. I mean, so, in order to try and support him, well, what about the three-and-a-half-year-old that you can talk to? They, they, they're an agent, you can talk to them, they have a facil facilitator with language, they're starting to even become capable of moral behavior, they start to have a sense of what's right and wrong, but, phew, they like even what happened today like and you try and get them to relate that to you it's not there now do we want to say that they are there there's no self there um that that's a very problematic thing to say no of course we wouldn't say that but what but what i would say is the example of the three-year-old we would see that as some kind of developmental like a, that that there was something developmentally insufficient about the fact that the three-year-old was not able to to compress and revise the course of the day within a structure that accounted for it more comprehensively than just a bunch of discordant events like you know what i mean like it, on account of the three-year-old, I think we would say that there was something lacking in terms of the overall coherence or integrity of sure. the representation. But I presume the same is not true of Strassen. So well, I don't know how those two examples fit so together. What he claims is he has a, 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 a kind of more of a, a logical and epistemic structuring of those episodes together that do not represent the, the standard defining features of what a narrative is. Uh, to my mind, it sounds like what's holding the episodes together is something more like an argument than a narrative. Um, and he thinks that what functions uh, sort of perfectly well. Uh, and again, I don't see how to challenge him. Again, so as an adult, here's where I'm not defective. I have been in extended periods of the flow state. I have been in extended, right, deeply extended periods oh. of the flow state. And the narrative self is gone. That's one of the defining mm -hmm. features of it. But my agency has not become defective right. because of that. Sure. In, in, instead, it has become precisely totally. enhanced. enhanced. Yeah. So what I'm saying right. is if you consider both of those together, right, um, the, you know, then Strassen's, again, I, I agree with you. I can't sort of get phenomenologically what this is other than these, ex these experiences I'm relating to. It, it's not my sort of sustained sense in the world. But I have extended periods where my agency and my sense of presence are heightened and functioning at their best, and the narrative self is gone. Um, so, yeah. So, so for me, what I want to do is I maybe along Christopher's line. Let me just ask a few questions just to get clear about what we mean by narrative, because it sure. like so many. Like so, one of my first questions is how much narrative do we have without any linguistic propositional knowing? Yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, thank you, Greg, because I want to answer this. And I want to say that trying to get narrative without um, propositional la language strikes me as, as an impossible thing to do. But, but we have very clear evidence for a robust sense of self in non-linguistic animals, totally. which would be clear evidence again of, uh, you know, a functioning sense of self that is happening outside, not depending on narrative for its existence. Totally. So, so yeah, I mean, for me, or, or you know, what I'm going to say is narrative is an add-on. I mean, you get a mental organ of justification that's going to get yeah. added on to the perspectival participatory system. That is the core, you know, and that's why, and when you're in flow state, you're a perspectival participatory machine and you may be tracking semantic knowledge, but yeah. the self-conscious narrator it's not double checking what the hell's going no, on. It's just like, no. go. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. This is golden, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. basically. The other thing I'll say is when I, and certainly nothing with Strassen, but as a clinician, the disruption of the normal socio-emotional narrator is not uncommon, okay? Right, you, right. Like in autism or in other kinds of structures. I mean, this is a propositional socio-emotional skill that develops 
in participatory roles and people are more naturally inclined to this kind of dance um, or not, depending on all sorts of potential variables. Yeah, so thank you, Greg. And, and um, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, Chris, I'm not trying to make an absolute argument here. I'm trying to problematize. Yeah, uh, so I guess I'm just agreeing that absolutely, yeah, that, yeah. that, that, that narr especially narrative at the structure of the cell from an evolutionary perspective, I certainly want to say that 500,000 years ago, if we're engaged in dance and broken symbolic language and in an inner subjective space here, but don't necessarily have a woven autobiographical religious meaning, I am self in the world and this is my purpose kind of deal. That's an add on, I guess is, is that Yeah, I would fair? be, uh, yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's, that's what, what, I, what I'm, yeah. That's what I'm suggesting, at least. Okay, then I think um, we're okay. Yeah, I just wanted to be uh, clear about that. Again, I, I'm not even clear that I'm going to make sort of make that a final claim. All I want to do is is suggest we that should. as a intellectually and plausible uh, possibility, right. and therefore right. the folk model of the self has been problematized therein. That was that was Absolutely. what. So. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of at the limit of our time. I'll just foreshadow what's going to come next. Um, I, I thought we'd get to it this time, and I sort of promised, but we'll get it to it th next time, which is I want to move into the thingness of the self and go to the work of two psychologists, William James and Arthur Dykeman, and really problematize the thingness of the self and talk about, well, there's a core aspect of the self that seems to be no thing uh, at all. And I promise you that when I do that, That'll tell you why I, we've entitled this series, The Elusive I, capital I, because the I, in, in contrast to the me, uh, doesn't seem to be any kind of thing at all, at least not phenomenologically. And so uh, the no thingness of the self is going to deeply challenge the claim that the self is a kind of thing. Um, and again, this is pervasive, it's cross-cultural, you see it in mystical traditions, you see different psychologists coming from, it's from very different angles, James and Dykeman, lots of convergence on this. And so the, again, what does that tell us about the self? So that's where we're gonna go forward. But as always, I like to tr try to sort of shut up and give you know, Greg and Chris some space for you know, reflections, riffing, any final summative things they want to say. I, I would say just that um, this, the, the problem, so the disruption of the integrity of the narrative form and its essentialism is a really, really interesting thing. And we're going to obviously keep talking about this, but one thing I maybe want to foreshadow a little bit is that the discovery, the very significant discovery that narrative and memory, I'm going to speak of them synonymously. They're obviously not the same thing, but I'm going to speak of them as a pair for, for this moment that the insight that there is, there is no necessary continuity, no literal or actual continuity to the narrative structure that is um, perhaps metaphysically necessary seems like something that's very th threatening and disruptive to the notion of the self. But in fact, I think will, I think will be, I know you make an argument for this already, John, and I think yeah. I may have one or two of my own in the offing, that in fact, the, discon the discontinuous structure of narrative is an affordance. Its pliability and its mutability is not something that need be threatening to the self, but simply threatening to a certain conception of the self. Exactly namely the, the Cartesian conception of the self. I know you're going to talk about that, so I don't want to, yeah, yeah. I don't want to take yeah. away your, I don't, want to, I don't want to take up the air of that argument in advance. But I think that one thing I think that's going to be very important is understanding the pliability of narrative as a virtue of that form, of a virtue of the psychotechnological function, rather than something that disarms it and robs it of value. And I think finding the value and the virtue in the pliability of narrative and the reconstructive nature of memory has everything to do with understanding the self as a symbolic entity rather than a literal one. Because I think it's the, it's the miscategorized actuality of the narrative that makes its discontinuity threatening. Oh. Yeah. And that's something I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to talking about. That's 
beautiful, Chris. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in deep consonance with what you said. Uh, and perhaps along the way, I mean, that's the resources to give a kind of deeper reply to, uh, you know, uh, Derrida, Foucault, and the way they've problematized the self and the subject. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. I think that's de definitely beautiful. We might talk about Schrag at some point, the self after postmodernism uh, and what he's been trying to do around that. Uh, so I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's beautiful and I look forward to that. Greg, any things you, any gatherings you want to draw? In? I felt present during this, John, and, and the <laughs> presencing was uh, very real uh, to me. So I think for me, you know, there's a grounding of the, you know, the nonverbal perspectival participatory primate. And, right. And, and that is going to be a core anchor um, epicenter for me. Uh, and right. relation, you know, um, and I think we've sort of set up what we can problematize and also what we can retain sort of in that frame. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and then this add on, uh, this late crazy evolutionary add on <laughs> that okay. around this justificatory narrative aspect. Okay. And that relation, I will tell you, of all the things that I pay attention to as a clinician. Okay. Yeah. over and over again is essentially the narrative relation with the experiential presence or not presencing self. Uh, right. That dynamic relation has everything to do uh, with whether I'm looking at character functioning or exactly the structure of somebody. Uh, that's the epicenter. So I'm really fascinated uh, about how we've structured this and how some of the clinical angles emerge. And really, as we get to this nexus point, of, of iteration between presencing and narrative. I'm very curious as to see how this will unfold. I think that's great. Uh, and, and I think you brought out something that we talked about last time and you did, I think, a really a valuable reformulation, right? But, um, but we talked about the, you know, the, 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 the non, they're not identical, but the deep inter interpenetration and interdefining of self, uh, Personality, which I which I like the way you reconfigured it, right? In terms of you know its its dispositional uh, aspects and its character aspects, and uh, I encourage people to go back and look at that section uh, because I thought that was really good. But also personhood, which is this moral legal thing, and I I I would say that I'm very I'm very more than comfortable. I'm sort of confident that, and this is where I think Greg's work and mine. Um, converges, Chris, in a way that I think you'd find appropriate to what you're, you're trying to put your finger on. I, I think that narrative is necessary for a self to be a person. Um, um, and and that's, that's something important. And, and again, like you said, there's this symbolic, non-literal, um, and, and, right, and you know, maybe we can play with the Neoplatonic idea that between the, the literal and the metaphorical is the participatory, which is neither literal nor metaphorical. Um, but yeah, those, the connections between selfhood and personhood, um, I think are really a key to what's been going on in the last sort of 15 minutes of our trilogue. Amen, amen. That, that, that dynamic nexus, yeah. a lot of gold to be mined there. Well, of course, um, but it, it, it's Lots weird. Of gold. Yeah, there's weird things like we, we, we think one of the justifications for the moral protection of personhood is precisely because selves are somehow intrinsically valuable. So you see this in a lot of the movement in which people are trying to extend ethical, uh, ethical rights to non-human animals, uh, yeah. precisely because although they're not right, capable of the moral and legal responsibilities of personhood, they are nevertheless selves and therefore should, they should be drawn under the umbrella in the same way we draw you know, a four month old human being under the umbrella uh, precisely because uh, 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 we think that a self is an in, sort of an inherently valuable thing. Uh, but we'll also have to talk about that because another problematization that Hood is gonna bring out is the self isn't, um, isn't sort of uh, self-subsisting. It is, it is socially emergent and constructed. And does that mean it's only socially attributed? And oh no. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about that too. There's lots. Yeah. Uh, to do to, for uh, the three of us to continue uh, to do. Um, I once want one again, once again, want to thank the two of you again. This, you know, I, the way this always exceeds 
um, you know, my expectations and the argument that I'm presenting and things get drawn out and developed. So I, I just want to thank both of you again so much. Thank you, John. That's great. Thanks, John. And thanks, Greg. Yeah, this was fun. This was fun. I'm really looking okay. forward to where it goes. Okay, everyone, take good care and uh, we'll see you next time on part three of the elusive eye, the nature and function of the self.